everyone. Welcome to the second session of Life with Megha, where I answer your questions on mental health. Uh, I hope all of you are doing well and are taking good care of yourself. Um, and I hope everyone is, you know, having a good week and is preparing for Thanksgiving and taking care of a lot of things at home. Um, so today is one of those days where I've got a few questions that were emailed to me and I thought, why not answer them uh, right away and get into it? Uh, but before I begin, I wanted to make one thing clear with a lot of you out there. Um, I'm answering questions on mental health, uh, which means that these are basically insights into how you are functioning. Um, I don't want you to take this as like, you know, you you are going through something and that is all that needs to be done. If you require help, then I do suggest that you go and speak to a mental health professional face to face or start thinking about getting into some kind of therapy. Um, all of the things that I talk about are coming from my own experience as uh, a mental health professional. All right. So without further ado, let's get into the first question. What are some of the challenges that you see in online counseling versus in-person counseling? Is one better than the other? Now, this was asked to me where asked to me very recently by one of the people on one of my other social media platforms as, as well. So I thought, why not answer it on my live, uh, live stream? Uh, the, so I'm going to list out what I feel are the pros and cons of both. And then I will let you be the decision of if online therapy is going to really suit you. So what happens in an online therapy session is that you move all of your sessions from being face to face to being more online uh, with your therapist. Now, when you are in a face to face session, you know, your therapist has more control over the environment that you're in. Your therapist is pro able to provide you with a very secure and safe environment. And obviously, when you're in a office space of your therapist, you are in a very confidential space. Now, if you were to do this online, then, you know, you have to make sure that wherever you're having the session with your therapist, it's confidential, which means you have to make sure that there's nobody around you because you're talking about your, you know, deepest and darkest feelings. Um, and you have to also make sure that you are in a quieter space. Now, if you're sharing your home with your family, then that sometimes becomes really difficult, you know, to find that space and, and, that, and that privacy. So that is, you know, one of the pros and cons you need to look at. Secondly, I also feel that when you are in a face to face session, your therapist is noticing you for a lot of body languages. Uh, when you are on an online session, the therapist is only able to see what is shown. Like in this video right now, you can only see me talking. I'm not you probably are not able to see maybe my hand gestures or what other body languages that that are indicative to a therapist that you're feeling something. Um, and what happens when you have an emotional breakdown in your session if you are with your therapist in a face-to-face -face session your therapist can help you control it give you strategies right away whereas sometimes i've seen with online sessions that when a client gets emotionally uh you know stressed they have the ability to just log off the session without having the therapist help them fully address the situation so again, that is kind of like, you know, a drawback of online counseling, because if the patient, if the client is not doing well, then they can easily say, you know what, I don't want to talk about it. And then they can lock themselves off. And now they are stewing with their own feelings and thoughts. And there's nobody there to help them navigate those difficult feelings. And one of the other things that I also have realized that happens with online counseling is, you know, the internet connection can get a little bit, you know, sucky. Let's just see what it is. It can become a little crazy. So if you don't have a proper internet connection, there's going to be a definite lag between, you know, maybe what your therapist is trying to convey to you versus what you're trying to convey. And if, you know, you miss out on either one of them, then it does cause an issue. So these are some of the challenges that I have seen with online counseling and that some of my colleagues have also mentioned and I've read about that online counseling is beneficial. If you are somebody who's been in regular counseling sessions with your therapist and need that required help, then online counseling helps you get 
into a regular contact with your clients, uh, sorry, with your therapist. So we are going to weigh out the pros and cons right now because of the pandemic, it is very difficult for a therapist to have in-person, um, you know, sessions. So look forward to getting uh, into online counseling just for the time being till, you know, the, the pandemic calms down and they're able to get you into your into their own uh, office space again and again get you back into that space of being confident you know in the space of confidentiality and all of the other things that really matter so i hope this answers a very important question that i've seen a lot of people ask is if online counseling is better than in-person counseling and if i think one is better than the other it all depends on the person who is um, you know, uh, what their feelings are towards both. I kind of wanted to list out the pros and cons, and I wanted you to also know the that this is what you need to be aware of if you decide to go into online counseling. I hope you all are having a nice, nice cup of coffee ready. Um, I'm going to definitely grab one before I grab a sip of coffee before I move on to my next question. Can you talk of the parenting mistakes that you've seen that can affect a child's mental health? See, you know, this is a very, very good question. And the reason I feel that it's a very good question, especially these days, because I've seen a lot of parents put kind of different pressures on their child. So first of all, the biggest parenting mistake I've seen in the recent times is putting a lot of pressure on your child. It may, I have seen parents push their children almost to a brink where they're going to school, coming back, doing activities, which causes the child to become overwhelmed. They're trying to keep up with schoolwork, then they're trying to keep up with their, with their after-school activities. Whatever it is that they're trying to do, it, it just overwhelms them. And now they're always trying to constantly uh, impress their parents, uh, and which ultimately leads to higher levels of stress higher levels of anxiety and some children have also shown depression because it's too much for them to manage um, the second biggest mistake that i sometimes see parents make is kind of ridiculing your child in front of others or maybe just not being appreciative of what they are saying um, some of the sentences could be like are you sure you want to do this or why did you do that you know, that tone makes a big, big difference to a child, especially if it's a younger child uh, below 10 years of age. Parents have to be really mindful about what they are talking about and how they are saying it in front of their child. If you start to ridicule your child in front of, say, their friends, you're inadvertently having them develop low self-esteem issues. And that causes a toll on their mental health because now they're constantly thinking about if they're good enough in anything that they do. So if you feel that your child has done something wrong, then take that conversation away from the situation. Find a small private place and talk to them and say, you know what? Hey, you know, I didn't appreciate what you did last time or what you did just a few minutes ago. Let's have a chat about it at home. You know, having that conversation is much better than kind of ridiculing them in front of their friends. One of the other things that I have also seen uh, that parents do is uh, compare their children or compare it with their, compare the child with their friends. Um, so do not compare your children with others. Again, it boils down to their self-esteem. If they are not sure of themselves, then they will not be portraying that out into the world because constantly in their mind is the thought of maybe they're not living up to their parents' expectations. Maybe they're not, you know, doing what is being told of them. So be mindful of those kind of situations. Um, it can also lead to a bit of bullying situations if your child is not able to speak up for themselves. So have them talk about their feelings at home. That is another mistake that I've seen most parents make is that they don't um, have a conversation about emotions. Now, this is very common in children. So if I see children and especially boys, 
uh, that's where I've seen that they've been told that, you know, maybe crying is not important or they shouldn't cry. They should be manly enough. That takes a big toll on a boy, especially a young boy who's trying to navigate how to talk in front of others. Um, if you are constantly telling this child that they cannot speak their feelings in front of others, now you've created a child who's very timid. So you have to be very careful again of how you view your, how you're talking to your child. If you are not allowing your child to express, express their emotions, it can also lead to situations where your child could potentially get bullied at school. So be aware of what your child is trying to convey to you. Talk to them about their feelings. Tell them it's absolutely fine for them to come to you and have a conversation of when they're feeling sad or when they're feeling angry. So have a good open communication with your child so that they develop a very strong and good mental health. Well, I hope this answered your question. Let's see what the next question is. How do you know if a therapist is genuinely interested in me as a client? What can I look for in my therapist? Now, that is a very, very good question. It, it kind of tells me that you are looking to get into therapy and that you are looking to find a therapist that suits your needs. So I would recommend finding a therapist who is specialized in what they do. So for example, if you're looking to find a therapist who has anxiety or, uh, or depression, uh, you know, speciality, then find a therapist that specifically mentions it on their site that they're trained in anxiety and depression disorders. Then you would note that this therapist is going to be taking care of you to their best ability. The other way to know that a therapist is genuinely interested in you is because they'll be actively listening. They'll be maintaining eye contact, which means they are paying attention to every single word you're saying. Secondly, you will also see that your therapist knows when to back off. So let's say you're feeling distressed at your session. Now the therapist, instead of being pushy, which I've seen some therapists do in sessions, they will know that they have to back off a little bit, give you space. And then maybe ask you, you know what, hey, do you want to have this conversation right now? Or do you think it's better to have this conversation at a later time? So whatever it is, your therapist is going to be mindful about it. Next, I want you to also look uh, at the therapist if they remember important dates in your life. So if somebody, if you go to a therapist and you have a situation where you're grieving, um, it is important for the therapist to know who you're grieving, when did the person pass away, what were the circumstances, and keep in mind that the therapist is aware of those very important dates in your life. So having a therapist who knows all of these things is going to guide you in the right direction. That means a therapist is genuinely interested in taking care of you. Also, when you are looking for a therapist, I also suggest you find a therapist who is not, you know, who will challenge you in the sessions. You don't want a therapist to just listen and tell you to explore your feelings. It is imperative that your therapist also kind of challenges you and navigates you through your emotions and feelings. Because if you're not able to do that, then you're not taking the full benefit of a therapeutic session. So all of these qualities in the therapist are definitely going to help you. I hope this answers your question. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have a quick sip of my coffee because it is coffee with Mega. And, uh, you know, I would like to know what, uh, how, what, where are you all from? Where do you live? And if you're finding benefit from this video. All right, so let's move on to my next question. I have been depressed ever since quarantine started, but the last time I told my parents, they took me to a therapist who told them that I was exaggerating my symptoms. I feel worse. What can I do to convince my parents that I need help? This is a very good question. Um, and again, I will answer this more from my own professional um, opinion. But if you are depressed, I know you're looking for a therapist and I do suggest you find one. 
Um, I get this question a lot on my other social media platforms where a lot of teenagers try and ask for help, but they don't know how to reach out to their parents. It becomes really hard for a child to talk to their parents. In this case, to me, it looks like your therapist kind of, you know, wasn't paying attention to what you were feeling because when this quarantine happened, a lot of teenagers, a lot of young adults ended up having a lot of mental health issues because, you know, given that we were told to isolate, you know, it's social life is big for you guys. So it takes a toll on your mental health. We're not able to talk to your friends when you're not able to talk to your, uh, you know, your closest family. It takes a toll on your mental health. Then I also suggest, I also think that when you are all living in a closed environment within the four walls of your home, there's no space. So that also ends up causing a little bit of an issue with uh, children of young age who are teenagers and young adults. I suggest that when you want to convince your parents, sit them down and tell them, hey, you know what? I really want to have this conversation with you. Um, I don't think the previous therapist actually understood what I'm feeling, but this is what I want you to listen. I've been feeling isolated. I've been feeling depressed because of all of these things. Now, all of these things could be, you know, missing your friends, not having enough space at home, or just feeling sad because everything else has come to a standstill in your life. Maybe you're not able to go to school. So all of these things are actually going to help convince your parents. Let your parents know that you want to meet a therapist who is trained in anxiety and depression disorders. That is the key. You need to find a therapist that mentions that on their profile. Otherwise, they're not able to understand what somebody is going through. What it is that a depression person, especially in quarantine, feels. So make sure that when you are trying to convince your parents, you ask them to meet a therapist who is trained in depression. Well, I hope this answers your question. Um, I hope you find the right therapist because it is imperative that if you are going through something, you have somebody to talk to and you have somebody who is skilled in that manner. The next question is, my therapist said that she can't change the way I feel and she can't take away my pain. What is the point of therapy then if she can't do those things? Now, that is a very, very good question. When you have somebody who says uh, they cannot take away your uh, pain, it is because a therapist cannot do that. A therapist and the therapeutic process means that your therapist is helping you navigate your feelings. It is you who needs to understand what it is that you're going through. It is you who needs to understand how you can process those deep feelings and recover from them. It's not easy. It's not easy for the person who's going through it to process all of those emotions. So it is imperative that when you ask, when your therapist is telling you that she can't take away your pain, it's because she genuinely cannot. It's up to you to say, you know, well, how can I take my pain away? Who was responsible for causing this pain in me? Who was responsible for making me feel this way? Is there a way that I can forgive this person? Is there a way that I can have this person say sorry to me? What is, what is it that this person needs to do that caused me the pain that's going to start helping me in my recovery process? So when your therapist says that she can't change the way you feel, then I have to agree with her because you are the only person who can work through this process. You are the only person who can say, hey, you know what, I'm feeling angry today because of this. I need to work through it. I need to understand why this anger suddenly came. So your therapist can then guide you in the right direction. But it is you who needs to do the work. We can help you and guide you, but we cannot you know, take away all of these things from you. You know, we cannot take your pain away. We cannot take those feelings away. So I really need you to kind of focus on that part of your therapy and take actual benefit from the therapeutic process. As a therapist, have you ever lost control of a session? Now, this is a very, very interesting question. Uh, 
yes, I actually, when I was working, I did kind of lose control of a session. Um, and that was because I was, I felt that I wasn't given the right information. So this is what happened. Um, I was seeing a 10 year old uh, boy, but prior to seeing that child, I always have a session with the parents to understand what are their concerns and see if I can kind of get an understanding of what the child is doing at home that has caused them to come into therapy. So the mother said, hey, you know what? My child is not doing well. I only see him play video games. He's not focused on studies. Um, and so, you know, can you help him? I was like, yeah, you know what? Definitely I can help him. So I scheduled another session. And then we kind of, uh, I had a session with the child and I told the child, you know what? I am your therapist. So whatever you say is going to be said and is going to be in this confidential space. So he said, hey, you are you sure you're not going to tell my parents? I'm like, absolutely sure. I am your therapist. So we had good sessions. And then I found out that the parents were actually, uh, again, making the child do a lot of things and he was feeling overwhelmed. And the only way that he could actually take, you know, rest and take his mind off things was playing video games. So I was like, all right, that makes a lot of sense that you're feeling overwhelmed. And I had like this, I have this thing where in between sessions, I would, you know, maybe after five sessions or six sessions, I would have a session with the parents and kind of give them an update of how the counseling sessions are going, especially when the child is this young. So I called the parents back in and I had this conversation with them. I was like, this is what your child has said. And obviously I had permission from this 10 year old boy. Ask, you know, he said, okay, this is what you, you can tell my parents. So I started having this conversation with the parents. And I said, you know what, maybe it would be easier if you can, you know, just ease off those activities that he does and make it a little bit easier for him to have a little bit of breathing space. And all of a sudden, the father of this child got mad at me and said, I thought you were on our side. You're supposed to help him say that he has to do work. His grades are falling. And then the mother started accusing me of saying, you are brainwashing my child. And I was saying, no, I'm not. I'm not doing anything of that sort. This is what your child has said. This is what your, your son is wanting you to do is just take off, maybe give him a little bit of space. Uh, the father obviously got really mad at me and he said, you are supposed to be on my side. And I kept telling him, no, I'm not supposed to be on your side. I am your child's therapist and I am supposed to be, you know, not taking any sides in this. I'm counseling your child. That is when I knew that I was kind of duped, if that's the correct word, uh, because they felt that I was going to help them rather than help their son, which was not the case. And that is when I felt that I had lost control of the session because they were accusing me of doing something and I hadn't. I'm the child's therapist. And I want to make this clear that if you bring a child to a therapy session as parents, the therapist is going to be your child's therapist, not your therapist. The therapist's job is not to do your bidding. It is to help your child recover from whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, so this is an honest experience. This is many therapists who have to take care of, you know, a child go through because the parents expect something else and the child expects something else. And this is when, you know, a misunderstandings happen, but it's funny. I, and I hope that child is doing much better, but this is when I realized that, you know, I kind of lost control of that session, but again, I kind of realized and did my own self-reflection and thought maybe they were trying to find a therapist who does their bidding instead of truly helping their son. All right. The next question is what do therapists mean by doing the work? Do not let your past, example, childhood trauma, affect your present. I've been to countless therapists and they just listen to you talk. There's no action plan. I'm genuinely curious what the work is. Now, first of all, if you have a therapist who's not giving you an action plan, then you're probably not with the right therapist. A therapist, even though listens to what you're saying, they always have an action plan at the end. They always want you to do some sort of work to help you recover through your process. Now, you've mentioned you've had some childhood trauma, which means that you are living with some very, very dark emotional feelings, which means 
you have a lot of negative emotions that you need to process and help yourself on that recovery process. But if you have a therapist who's just listening and not helping you navigate that situation, that process, then you're never going to recover. You're never going to be on that path of recovery. It is important to process those layers of emotions that kind of start to form. I call them like this onion layer of emotions. There's a core feeling, which means, you know, that is the dark one that you don't want to deal with. It's very hard. And that is caused because of your trauma. Then you have these other layers that start to form, you know, start to form on top of these, the score feeling. And that causes, that's what the therapist has to work with. If we have to peel off those layers slowly and steadily, and then take you down to that core emotion so that you can process whatever it is that you're going through. And that is what doing the work means. Doing the work means getting yourself to acknowledge that something happened and how are you going to move forward what are going to be your coping strategies if you have a breakdown all of a sudden what are going to be some of the strategies that your therapist has you know put in place for you to help you move forward what are your coping mechanisms all of these are your work this is what your work means having strategies in place so that you don't feel alone when you're not with your therapist, having to have somebody to talk to, especially when say your therapist is not available, so you have a went, and processing all of those feelings. That is what doing the work means. Doing the work also means, you know, sometimes you don't wanna talk about certain things and that's fine, but also being mindful that you do have to go back to that certain emotion and work on it. It's the hardest part is to go back and make yourself say, hey, I want to do this. I have to work on it so that I start to come out of my negative thoughts and feelings. So that is what work in therapy means. Generally, every session will have, uh, every session that you have with a the therapist, you will get some sort of homework to do or some sort of activity to do so that you have a week where you're processing and understanding and you know, maybe coming up with questions for yourself. So this is what work in a therapeutic session looks like. So I hope that, you know, you find the right therapist. And again, I do emphasize if you're going through something as severe as a childhood trauma, then find a therapist who specializes in trauma that specializes in depression, because not everyone can, uh, can help you with childhood traumas. So you have to find somebody who is specialized and then you will start to see a difference in your life. How do I get over my therapist? I am always thinking about her and seeking her attention. I want to be able to leave the sessions and live the rest of the week without her constantly on my mind. Well, this is a very, very uh, interesting question. Um, there are two things that come to my mind when somebody is telling me this. One, that you're very dependent on your therapist, which means at some point, a transference has happened. Now, transference means that you have started to rely on your therapist as if you are, you know, it's like a mother figure or somebody that you're looking up to. That is what happens when you have this kind of transference. You are trying to understand how it is that this person has made you feel nice. So this is one indication that I get when somebody tells me that I can't get over my therapist and I need to have somebody uh, and then that she's constantly on my mind. Secondly, there's somebody in your life that was probably a maternal figure that you looked up to and you never got the right response. Now with this therapist, you are getting that attention that you need and you are getting the the care that you need and that's why it becomes hard now one other thing i want to also mention is if you are seeing this therapist on a face-to-face -face basis then you also were having a connection with her now all of the therapists that i know of have moved their sessions online where you then you lost your connection with your therapist and that is also where she's constantly on your mind is because you want somebody to talk to. 
Now, it's not possible for a therapist to be online present or you're not able to connect with your therapist. And that's why she's on your mind constantly. But that is something that I do urge you to look into and think about why this is. And that is how you're going to start processing this type of feeling. Now, I also want you to know that most therapists are trained in this kind of transference related therapy sessions. We are trained to understand, all right, you know, this is what happened. And the therapist can curb back something that they have done that has caused you to feel this attachment. So start having this conversation with your therapist. Let her know that this is what you're feeling. And I know it's going to be the hardest thing that you do is tell the person in front of you that, you know, you have developed feelings. But trust me, all therapists are trained to understand that this is what happens in sessions and they're able to help you navigate it. And in most situations, you will see that they are going to help you process, maybe find out who that person in your life was that you're kind of mimicking in the sessions right now, that you're kind of looking up to right now. So I hope this helps you uh, find kind of, you're not alone when you have, uh, you know, these kind of feelings. It is natural for clients to develop this relationship with a therapist because that's the only way they find connection and that's the only place they feel safe and secure to talk about their feelings. So I do urge you to have an open and honest conversation with your therapist. And I see I got some uh, comments here. Uh, so I wanted to thank Monica Mathur for giving me the support during this. Um, appreciate it. And Shobhag Miyotri, thank you so much. I really appreciate the kind words that you've given and that you like that I am doing a session like this. I uh, really appreciate your kind words. Um, I do hope that it's helping some of you out there and that all of you are getting some benefit of understanding what therapy looks like. So my next question is, um, can a depressed person ever feel happiness? So, you know, that's a very, very uh, uh, interesting question. That is because it's subjective. Happiness is subjective to everyone. You know, my happiness looks different. Your happiness looks different. For a depressed person, that happiness takes on a very, very different feeling, a very different meaning. Uh, you should understand one thing is that for a depressed person, happiness is like hope. It is the hope that was lost. One of the key symptoms of a person who's depressed is they have hopelessness in their life, which means they are not in that right frame of mind to ever feel happiness. But with therapy, they start to realize that their negative thoughts are actually a loop in their mind. They are actually in stuck in their own little world that they have created. So then happiness becomes subjective. Most of the times people who are under major depressive disorders need medications and therapy to pull them out of that zone of hopelessness. And then happiness then becomes very simple for a person who's depressed. You know, something like having less negative thoughts or somebody having, you know, just a moment of happiness where they appreciated, say, the birth of a niece, a nephew, their own child. That was enough to bring them into a zone of happiness. So it varies. But yes, the quest, the answer to this question is yes, a depressed person can feel happiness, but it is constant work. Because if you are depressed, you're in a negative thought loop. And to bring you out of a negative thought loop requires work. So when you feel happiness, it could be for the smallest things. Maybe just getting up and getting ready for your day is considered a happy day for you. Maybe doing something as making your own cup of coffee is something that made you happy. Because remember, when you're depressed, 
you are not able to do anything else except stay with your thoughts. So happiness is there for anybody who feels depressed. It's just subjective. So if you do something which is variant of your normal day, then that is happiness because you did something different. So yes, you do feel happiness even if you are depressed. Don't ever think that you're not going to feel happy. You will feel happy. And I want you to remember this, that happiness is subjective. Not everyone's happiness looks the same. So I hope this helps you, helps you understand that even if you are depressed, you are going to feel happy. Oh, um, got a nice, sweet little comment from uh, Anju S. Mathur. Thank you so much. I hope that it is helping you in this process. Uh, I do wish that, you know, that's my whole aim of doing this is to make sure that people understand the different types of mental health stresses that are out there. Thank you once again, and I appreciate all the positive feedback. I'm gonna take a quick sip of my coffee and then we can get right back into it. Is overthinking one of the main causes of depression? Absolutely. Overthinking is one of the main causes of depression. It, in our terms, it's called when we are ruminating our thoughts, which means we're constantly in a loop. And it kind of happens all of a sudden. So there has to be a triggering event in your life that generates you a negative response. So I'm going to explain this with an example. Let's say you are going to go give an exam. And, you know, instead of studying for the exam, you decided that you wanted to go out for, you know, a quick cup of coffee, enjoy with your friends. But the next day you didn't do well in your exams and then you failed them. Now what happens if you are a good student and you failed your exams because of one kind of choice you made, you might start thinking that you might fail all of your exams for a person who doesn't have the ability to kind of have that strong mental health capacity to say, no, you know what, it was just, this was just a one time thing. So now you're stuck again in a loop. Now you've seen yourself that, oh, I failed. So what's the point of studying? So you stop studying, then you fail again. And then again, you tell yourself the same thing till it becomes a loop in your mind. So now this has started affecting your self-esteem. Now, if this has started your self affected your self-esteem, the next logical thought is going to be, I'm not good at anything. So you can see how you can be stuck in a loop and have this loop take over your mind. So you have to be mindful about what you're thinking. And if this thought has started to become intrusive, are you thinking about this thought when you're just sitting and watching television? Are you thinking this thought when you're just you know, lying down and resting? What happens when you are just doing normal things? Is this thought overtaking your mind? So overthinking is one of the main causes of depression. When you start to you know, hone in on that one thought and you keep telling yourself that over and over and over again, you are going to start seeing effects of depression come over. Now, again, if you are somebody who is feeling depressed, I do urge you to find a mental health professional who is trained in this to help you right from the get go. Because remember, depression can take over your life. It can take over whatever it is that you are doing. It can take away from your normal life and put you into a zone where you don't know what to do. So if you feel like all of these thoughts are affecting you, then yes, you are probably having the first few signs of depression. Overthinking something just because it happened once does tend to lead to like, you know, a normal form of sadness. But if these thoughts suddenly become intrusive, then you are probably on the path of getting depressed. But nothing is certain in stone. Maybe you'll just recover one day out of out of the blue and say, hey, you know what, I'm doing much better now. So if you are overthinking, then figure out why you're overthinking. And if there's a way for you to think otherwise to stop this negative thought from taking over your life. For example, let's go back to what I just told you. If you failed an exam and this was just the first time you failed an exam, then that doesn't mean that you're gonna fail it every single time. You have to remember all of the other positive things that happen 
then you can kind of retake yourself and loop yourself back in. So I hope this answers your question. Uh, Monica Mathur asked me a question right now, so I'm going to put it on my screen. How does one get in touch with you or with me for professional consultation? So right now, I'm not taking on any new clients, but I am available by email. So you can email it to me at megha at meghamathur.com. And I will try my best to answer any questions that you have pertaining to your mental health. So do reach out to me. I will try my best. But I do recommend that you find another therapist that can help you wherever you're staying and get the right therapy. So let me move on to the next question. Why are people so obsessed with what they can never control and what is never going to change or stop, no matter what anyone says? So this is a very good question. The re when you don't have control over your own life, it means you've given up a choice. Uh, you've given up a choice of making a decision that you could have made on your own. So when, you are lost, when you've lost control of making that specific choice in your life, you feel things get out of hand. And then when you try to regain that back by you know, other things, and sometimes it becomes hard to realize that a choice was made, but you cannot go back and change it. So that obsession takes over, of, you know, why did this happen to me? Or why couldn't I go and do something else? And that is when that control becomes more obsessive in nature. And it will not stop till you kind of bring yourself back into a mindful moment and tell yourself, you know what, this happened to me. This is fine. I didn't have a control over that choice in my life, but I do have control with what I can do with this choice that was given to me. So you can get control back of your present situation, but you have to accept that if something already happened, you cannot go back and change that choice. You cannot go back and say, I want to do something else now. No, that's not going to happen. You have to go into your present situation and say, all right, this is where I'm at. Now what it is that I can do, which helps me regain this control where I thought I don't have in my life anymore. That is what is going to start you changing your path and coming out of the obsessive nature that happens when you think that you not, you do not have control over your life. And your second part of the question is, what is never going to change or stop no matter what anyone says? Remember, if you are obsessing about a certain thought, nothing anybody is going to tell you is going to change that perspective in your mind. Nobody's going to change it. And then unless you go back and tell yourself, you know what? This is what happened. I need to go forward. I don't need to look backwards. The more somebody tries to tell you something is the more you're going to start feeling angry and resentment. So this is what happens. People obsess over something they didn't have control over. And when somebody tries to point it out and say, hey, you know, maybe it is time that you move on, they become angry because now they've realized that they're in a point because somebody else made that choice for them. Or maybe they made a poor choice in life and now they can't go back and change it. It's sometimes the harshest truth for anybody to hear, even in a therapeutic session, right? It is the hardest thing to hear that maybe the choice we made wasn't right for us, which is okay. The point is to then make a choice where you can help, you can help yourself and say, now I've made the choice that will benefit the previous one. So you see how this works. If you obsess about something that you didn't have control over, all you're gonna feel is anger and resentment. Versus if you start to see that, okay, you accepted this choice, now what are the other choices present within this choice that will help you move forward? So, you know, think about that situation. Now that you're in it, what are your choices moving forward? And that is what's going to take you out of your obsessive zone into maybe a more calmer zone. You might have to think it through, figure out your right choices, and then make the right decision. So I hope this kind of answers your question on why people become obsessed 
when they can never control anything, kind of have a control on their life. Oh, that seems to be my last question for the day. <laughs> I got so involved in you know answering a lot of questions that I forgot that this was my last question. Um, I see a lot of nice and positive comments uh, that a lot of you gave me. Really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you found benefit from the session. And I hope that you were able to kind of understand a lot of things that a lot of people go through. And this session is, again, I started this channel as a means by which a lot of you can ask me mental health questions, get an understanding of what's going on, and then figure out for yourself if you need to go and get more help. Because I want to make sure that, especially in cultures where it's very difficult to talk about these things, that there is an avenue for you to understand that, yes, what you're feeling is normal and that it's OK to go into therapy. Um, so I hope that all of you got benefit from this. I do look forward to seeing you in my next session. And if you want to answer, if you want me to answer any of my, uh, any of the questions that you have on mental health, then do email them to me at megha at meghamathur.com. And I will uh, answer them on my next live stream. I just want to make sure that you all know that I will not break confidentiality. Um, I will not say your names on a live broadcast until and unless you post it in the open comment section where everybody can see your name, then that's another story. But if you email me your questions, I will not say your names. I will just email you back saying, hey, I've got your question and I will answer it in my next session. So if again, if you want me to answer your questions, then email me at megha at meghamathur.com. I hope to see you in my next live stream. Till then, I hope you're living your best life. Have a great day. Have a great Thanksgiving. Bye, everyone.